So um, good evening, you everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining. Um, once again, we draw tantalizingly close to the end of this series, but um, we are treated this evening by a really, really exciting uh, talk. Um, this, so having having brought us uh, with all the background, and it's nice to see some of the former speakers here this evening uh, on some great uh, uh, stories. Um, we have. Uh, Professor Lucy uh, notes here this evening, Professor of Modern History at uh, University of Essex, the holder of the Rab Butler Chair uh, in History, uh, and author, most importantly, of um, a book uh, called Dying uh, of the Nation, Death, Grief and Bereavement. I will share a link in a moment on it. Um, but uh, as one of the reviews that I read uh, said, it, it's a, it offered a very poignant reminder or uh, in, in, in light of the recent uh, uh, tragedy and, and, and death that we've experienced over the last couple of years. And I think that is also very interesting here because here I hope we have a chance to sort of move the conversation on and, and now start to look at the, 19, uh, the, the, the stories behind the 1940s. And so I suppose um, without butchering an excellent talk, I think probably safer, uh, in a moment to, to hand it over to you. But um, as with others, um, thank you to the, the Lunch Trust America for, for allowing us to use the, the, the Zoom. Uh, please put your Q&A in the box at the bottom and I will try and fill it in at the end. Um, the, the other lectures are on the website and as you will have heard when you joined, the lecture is being recorded and uh, in due course, I will share the link um, for those who aren't able to join this evening. Um, so I suppose yeah, without further ado, Lucy, thank you very much and over to you. Thank you, Robbie. Thanks very much. Thanks for coming, everybody. And thank you for inviting me. So I'm going to share my screen. I'll keep my camera on as well. I'll be a little head, disembodied head in the in the top corner. Um, we don't want useless memorials. It's a quote from the time commemorating the Second World War in the 1940s. So I'm going to be talking this evening about the commemoration of the dead of Britain's Second World War and the debates that this provoked towards the war's end and in its immediate aftermath. So I think looking back today, and Robbie and I were just chatting about this earlier, when we live in a society that seems at times to be obsessed with the Second World War, I'm sure we all remember being urged to show a blitz spirit during the first few months of, of the current pandemic, living in a society that's saturated in its memory and, and seems determined to find parallels with it, even when these clearly don't exist. And um, the, the, the cry of the, I've forgotten his name now, ex-UKIP MEP telling people that we should carry on going to pubs because the Blitz didn't stop people going to pubs and neither should a, neither should a pandemic would be, I think, a very good, completely useless parallel with the Second World War. And of course, living in a society in which remembrance of the Second World War dead has become a regular feature of shared national and international calendars. Think about the regular commemorations on the beaches of Normandy, for example. It can, I think, be difficult to remember just how controversial commemoration was at the end of the war and how very differently it was perceived. So it's become, in academic terms, it's become something of a commonplace to preface research on contemporary commemorations of warfare with Jay Winter's observation at the end of the 20th century was marked by what we term a memory boom in which the two total wars of the 20th century were revisited and reintegrated into everyday life. I'm just going to show this properly, I think, so it clicks up the whole screen. There we go. Um, so this would include a current wave of memorialisation. So just to give you a few examples of this here, I was there today with students, Green Park, the, the West End of Green Park in London, the memorial to, to Bomber Command that was finally erected in, uh, in 2012. Just a 10 minutes walk away on Whitehall, just kind of just up from and kind of in conversation with Luxon Cenotaph, the monument to the women of, of World War II, erected in 2005, and to move outside of um, London for a moment, the Blitz to commemorate the, um, sorry, the memorial to commemorate civilian victims of the Liverpool Blitz, which is on the pier head in Liverpool, and which again was erected in 2005. So the creation of these memorials needs to be understood, I would argue, as part of a contemporary desire to commemorate and memorialise the dead of wartime, a desire seen as much in the creation of the National Memorial Arboretum in Staffordshire, as in the marking of the return of 
um, soldiers' bodies in their cortages in Wootton Bassett between 2007 and 2011. And of course, in the renewed and widespread observance of Remembrance Day and Armistice Day. So we now tend to commemorate both our, uh, Remembrance Sunday and November the 11th. So as a nation that was at war pretty much continually for the first two decades of the 20th century, it shouldn't be surprising that we are keen to pay tribute to the dead of past wars, especially the Second World War, still widely remembered, of course, as a war in which the people came together to defeat tyranny and as Britain's finest hour. But this, however, appears to be in marked contrast to feelings about memorialization and commemoration of the British war dead in the immediate aftermath of war. And it seems evident that the memorials that a society creates tell us something about the beliefs, the values and the concerns of that society, the form in which they represent that being memorialised, what they decide to memorialise, who decides and where they place memorials, can all tell us about the power structures of that society and its wider concerns and values. So why were the British people then of the mid 1940s apparently so reluctant to erect memorials and enact commemorative ceremonies to honour and remember the dead of the Second World War? So although the numbers of British dead of that war were not as large as those as those of the First World War, they were nonetheless significant. This is the Commonwealth War Graves Commission Cemetery at Casino in Italy. Just to give you an example. Over 60,000 civilians were killed by aerial bombardment. Somewhere over 250,000 members of the British Armed Forces were killed and approximately 30,000 members of the British of the Merchant Navy. But as we know, the far more numerous dead in Britain of the Great War were marked by the creation of new war memorials, new traditions of remembrance and commemoration and new ways of burying and commemorating the military dead of war. Lutchen's cenotaph in Whitehall has symbolised the Empire's dead since 1919, when the first temporary cenotaph was erected there as part of Peace Day, the National Day of Celebration that was designed to mark the signing of the Versailles Agreement, the political end of the war and the victory of the Allies. And the first cenotaph, as I'm sure that you know, was of course an afterthought, erected swiftly and temporarily it was bought in July 1919, and in, unveiled on July the 18th, the day before Peace Day. It was created at the personal request of David Lloyd George, the then Prime Minister, who was impressed by the news that the French government were building a, I have to pronounce this poorly, a catafalque in Paris to act as a memorial to the dead, which troops, French troops, would salute as they passed during the French celebrations of the signing of the Versailles Treaty. And here's a nice colour tinted image of the marching past. So then, imagine the last minute addition to the Peace Day programme of victory parades and partying. The cenotaph proved to be deeply appreciated by the British people. Within a few days, it was estimated over a million people had visited it, many travelling long distances to do so. On the 21st of July 1919, the Times observed that the cenotaph is only a temporary structure made to look like stone. But Sir Edward Lutchen's design is so grave, severe and beautiful that one might well indeed wish it were of stone and permanent. And Lutchen's use of the classical tradition in his memorials, seen of course in his design for the Stone of Remembrance and the cemeteries of the Imperial War Graves Commission, as well as at the cenotaph, meant they were exceptionally well suited as to act as focal points for the memorialization and remembrance of numerous and diverse dead, those of all faiths and of none. The simplicity of the cenotaph, which of course means empty tomb, meant that it could stand for all of the war's dead and it's continued to stand for the dead of subsequent wars in more than a century since its first creation. Although Lutchens had considered including an image of a dead soldier as part of the design, this was dropped from the final cenotaph and I think its abstraction and simplicity give it both a timelessness and a universality that it would be far harder for a figurative memorial to achieve. So the replacement of the temporary cenotaph with a permanent one was agreed by cabinet just 11 days after peace day on 30th of July 1919 and it was unveiled on the 11th of November 1920, the second anniversary of the armistice. 
The internment of the unknown soldier in Westminster Abbey, literally just around the corner, was also a part of the Armistice Day ceremony in 1920. And within a week, both the cenotaph and the grave had been visited by over a million people. And the cenotaph was said to be 10 feet deep in flowers. You can see some of the flowers in the photo there. So Armistice Day swiftly became a key moment in the national calendar and local committees were organized around the country to fund and commission war memorials in cities, towns and villages. While many of these followed the cenotaph in having um, an abstract um, or, or figurative, even classical design, others made, sorry, non-figurative classical design, others made use of figures as a Smurfa Tidville War Memorial there in the center, which is, is, is one of my favorites, has a woman on the right hand side of the screen, they're holding a baby kind of looking down, holding out her hand in supplication. Um, while still more, of course, she used the, the, the Celtic cross as a centerpiece. And up there you can see the one by Menai Straits Bridge in North Wales. What they did all have in common though, was that they acted as focus, as a shared focus for the shared acts of remembrance. And in particular, the two minutes silence held across Britain in the aftermath of war. And a report in the Manchester Guardian of the first marking of Armistice Day in 1919, gives us some sense of the occasion. I won't read out the whole thing, I'll just read some extracts from this. It says that it begins with, it may be doubted whether the great central streets of Manchester have ever before been so silent as they were for two minutes yesterday morning. Even during the dead hours of the night, there's ordinarily some little stir of traffic, and on Sunday, silence never completely falls. Yesterday's silence was but the more impressive because it came in the presence of every conceivable possibility of commotion. The peace came out of tumult and passed swiftly into tumult again. It describes a silence. It describes it as, as a silence that like the Egyptian darkness might almost be felt. It says the faintest noises now took on the portentousness of the little noises that fill a church. And it ends, a woman coughed 50 yards away a baby gave a faint cry. One could not move a foot without self-consciousness. Here and there were persons crying quietly, women furtively drying their eyes. The street seemed the centre of a calm, which one felt to be reaching out to an undefined circumference. One began to wonder whether a more wonderful idea than this had ever entered man's head. This simple, impressive, be still and know. But just 18 years later, in 1937, a woman writing for the mass, for, for mass observation, social survey organization, I'll talk about in some more detail in a moment, and keeping one of their day diaries for Armistice Day that year, described it slightly differently. She described looking out of her window upstairs and seeing two cars draw up at the side of the road and men get out and stand hatless in road. A small old fashioned Austin seven passes driven by a man. At his side sits a woman wiping away tears with a handkerchief. The same year, 1937, saw the disruption of the Whitehall Ceremony of Remembrance by Stanley Storey, and you can see um, you know, a photo of this here, who was an ex-soldier, a veteran of the First World War, described in newspapers as having escaped from a psychiatric hospital, and who was captured in BBC radio coverage of the service, shouting about hypocrisy and preparing for war, and you can see him going disappearing under some policemen there with, I think that's uh, Chamberlain and possibly Atley, I'm not sure, standing nearby looking on. This was widely covered in the press, but the emphasis was on the King's and the politician's calmness and maintenance of silence by the Royal Party and other dignitaries, even as Stanley was being manhandled away by police. However, a more careful reading of the Mass Observer's diary from 1937, I think, shows us that attitudes towards war remembrance were perhaps starting to change. While she noted the men who stopped their car and stood by the side of the road to observe the silence, the other car, albeit with a weeping female passenger, continued on its way. Other diarists from mass observation the same year give us a rare insight into some of the thoughts and the feelings of those marking or sometimes attempting to avoid marking the armistice. But before I talk about this, I want to briefly introduce Mass Observation as an organisation because I'll be talking about it quite a lot and drawing on material they collected in this talk. 
So mass observation, and I should I should declare an interest. I'm a trustee of mass observation. Um, mass obs was mass observation was founded in 1937 to create what they called an anthropology of ourselves, to capture the thoughts and particularly the feelings of so-called ordinary people. They collected a range of data and used a variety of methods to do this. The recruitment of a volunteer panel of writers, known as the National Panel, who answered wide-ranging questionnaires or directives several times a year. During the Second World War, the National Panel were also encouraged to keep diaries and send these into mass observation every few months. Uh, day diaries, like the one that I've just quoted, in which they asked people to keep a diary for a day or for part of a day. It was usually May the 12th, but also on other significant days, and to send these in as a kind of uh, sort of a snapshot of the nation. These were combined with traditional surveys conducted on street corners or sometimes door to door, and, and observation of people going about their daily lives by a small number of paid staff who were paid to observe people's behaviour in public. And of course, there was also the work town study. You can visit and you can look at details and look at some of Humphrey Spender's beautiful photos of Bolton as work town, which was, was work town. It was you know, a lightly disguised study of Bolton in the Northwest, um, a kind of ethnographic attempt to study the people of Bolton, Lancashire, by largely a group of volunteer and sometimes very, very low paid Cambridge graduates who moved up to Bolton with Tom Harrison, one of the founders of Mass Observation, uh, moved into a small terraced house, worked there, lived there for several months and wrote down, recorded everything they saw. And when Humphrey Spender joined them, he took lots and lots of photos. And I'd, I'd really recommend going to this website and having a look um, if you're interested in the mid 20th century. So while mass observation does not offer us the kind of representative sample that we might be used to in um, polling organisations, it does, and it continues to, offer us unparalleled access to the subjective thoughts, feelings and experiences of some of the people, the kind of material that's unavailable in more traditional quantitative sources. So back to Armistice Day 1937 then when mass observers, the day diarists, were asked to keep a detailed diary of their activities between 10.30 and 11.30 a.m. Similar material was collected the following year in 1938 via a door-to-door -door survey, and during the Second World War, they observed people's behaviour on November the 11th. So by 1937, the rituals of Armistice Day had become deeply embedded into the fabric of everyday life. Our first diarist went on to describe returning quickly after the 11 o'clock silence to the kitchen to start cooking lunch, while a journalist in London explained that he spent several minutes deciding whether to have his bath before or after the 11 o'clock silence. A woman in Kent listening to the ceremony on the radio described putting down her knitting for the silence, but picking it back up again afterwards. Another woman, one of my favourite entries, described how she was always awfully embarrassed if she was around people in the silence, so she locked herself in her bathroom to have a cigarette to avoid being in the same room as her cleaner during the silence. Observers in Bolton participating in the Worktown project took very detailed notes of behaviour at the town's war memorial and recorded other ways that um, the commemoration was marked in the town. And you can see it was widely observed, but that this, uh, this observation shows how it also became in part part of the town's commercial enterprises. So this is a sketch of the engineering service company in Market Street, Bolton, where they've arranged electric fires behind a reef to look like um, war graves. And my favourite from Bolton or Worktown was the the front window of the light of the Lido cinema where um, there's a wooden cross to represent a grave and um, sort of green fabric with poppies has been piled up to look like you know the aftermath of the battlefield and an early an early war cemetery um, but the apparently very cold observer who placed themselves by the cenotaph for several days took lots of detailed notes of people's actions and comments at the Bolton Cenotaph, Bolton War Memorial, sorry, um, not just on the 11th, but for several days afterwards. So here's just one of their cards 
for people's behavior by the War Memorial on the 12th of November, 19, 1937. And it's, it's full of the, the kind of um, so comments like, see, that's from his mother and dad. It's a pity, isn't it? Well, I'll go home. I'm glad that I've seen them. I come every year. Isn't it a shame for all their loved ones? So, so many people did stop to look at the reeves, but many others just passed by, maybe glancing at it as, as, they, as, as they passed. But what's absent from the, the observations of people's behaviour in Worktown and for most of the day diaries is any sense of a real personal connection to the ceremony. You do find that sometimes, but not as often as you might expect. So by the late 1930s, the majority of people, both in Bolton, also writing from mass observation, thought that the day was largely for others, not for them. And some spent the silence as well, thinking not about the war that had been, but about the war that was to come and the very different form that they expected it to take. And the Second World War did, as we know, take a very different form to the Great War. Air raids, imagined by military theorists in the interwar years as a means to avoid the static war of attrition that had been seen on the Western Front, brought death to many hundreds of thousands of civilians across the world without ever leading really to the collapse in morale and the subsequent need for governments to sue for peace that military theorists had so confidently predicted. For Britain, it was also a war for a new kind of society and for the creation of a more egalitarian, fairer Britain. Reconstruction, which was discussed from at least 1940, was not envisaged as simply being about rebuilding Brits towns and cities, important though that was, but it was also much wider. It was about reconstructing society. It was a debate that saw the election in 1945 of Clement Attlee's reforming Labour government, the creation of both the Welfare State and the NHS, as set out in the Beveridge Report of 1942. And debates about the commemoration of the war dead, which began before the end of the war, were shaped by, they were, they were part of their time, they were shaped by these debates about social and political change and the meaning of the war, as much as they were about the aesthetic or commemorative qualities of war memorials and ceremonies. So one key way that the dead were commemorated after the Second World War was in the reintroduction of, um, of ceremonies at war memorials and the creation of Remembrance Sunday in 1945. So Armistice Day ceremonies had been abandoned in 1939 in attempt, it was said, to prevent large crowds gathering in city centres and the subsequent loss of life that could be caused by aerial attack. But also, I think, because the, the First World War, the Great War, had become known as the war to end all wars. And it was politically um, inconvenient, I think, to be marking a war to end all wars in the midst of the Second Total War, just some 20 years later. But after the end of the Second World War, MPs and civil servants very quickly began to consider the reintroduction of some form of National Memorial Day. They said in commemoration of two national deliverances and the fallen of both wars. And different days and months were suggested as possible replacements for November the 11th, which had no real meaning for the Second World War. But however, November the 11th fell on a Sunday in 1945 and that alleviated the need to decide whether or not to continue marking the First World War armistice in the aftermath of the Second for another year and then just kind of fell into the habit of marking um, the dead of both wars on the Sunday nearest to November the 11th. So the Home Office were very keen to ensure a sense of continuity from the pre-war to the post-war years. They searched out records of the numbers of officers attending, the music played and the order of service from 1938. One key difference reflecting the changing nature of death and service in both wars, was the inclusion of women's auxiliary corps members in the march past the sanitar and the laying of a wreath by the Home Secretary in memory of civil defence workers who'd been killed. Reflections on continuity and change informed newspapers' coverage of the ceremony the following day. The Times reflected on how the day had, and I quote, all the solemnity and dignity which marked the succession of Remembrance Day ceremonies until 1938. And his claims to timelessness, though, were undercut by reflections on the events and changes of the war that the ceremony appeared to invoke. 
much of this focused around women's role in the, in the ceremony, their presence as bereaved mothers and widows being widely commented on as an eternal aspect for Daily Mail. When they've forgotten all else that happened during the National Service of Remembrance at the Cenotaph yesterday, many will still remember that long procession of black clad women that moved slowly through the dense crowds in Whitehall with the blood red poppies of sacrifice in their hands. The old and the young side by side had come together in a sisterhood of sorrow. So while thousands attended the 1945 Remembrance Ceremony in general, people were far less willing than in the aftermath of the Great War to see swathes of cultural and geographical space, geographic space given over to the memorialization of the war's dead. As the war began to come to an end in Europe, British artists, architects, church leaders and politicians began to consider how best to commemorate the dead. The Royal Society of Arts held a conference to consider the form that memorials might take in 1944 and formed the War Memorials Advisory Committee in the same year. This suggested that memorials could be monuments in civic sites, within churches, or they could be utilitarian, useful living memorials, like playing fields, hospital wings, and new school buildings. The council was concerned to avoid replicating what they called the mere standardized products of commerce, which they saw as blighting the memorializing impulse at the end of the First World War but at the same time urged caution regarding utilitarian memorials, urging that while usefulness was important, reflecting as it did the aims for which the war had been fought, they urged that whatever form they took, they must obviously and unmistakably be war memorials. The council linked the two world wars in terms of aims and sacrifice, stating that, for the second time in a generation, Britain and the cause of freedom have been saved by the willing sacrifice of life itself by thousands of our fellow countrymen and women. For a second time, there will be a nationwide desire that such self-sacrifice shall be worthily commemorated. Every town and village that erected a memorial to those who died in the 1914-18 struggle will be concerned to hold no less honour to the fallen of the present total war, combatants and civilians alike. But unlike the First World War, this war was to be marked by memorials, which both commemorated the dead and attempted to enact some of the causes for which they died. And in 1944, five years into the People's War and 18 months after the publication of the Beveridge Report, this largely was, was understood, was largely understood to mean increased welfare provision and the creation of a more egalitarian society. Local authorities writing to the council for advice overwhelmingly wanted to create memorials that were useful, living memorials, in the terminology of the time, and suggestions for playing fields, for schools, hospital wings and almshouses, sat alongside plans for village halls, we can see a village hall there, for bus shelters, that's a memorial, bus shelter, and a playground, that's the War Memorial Playground in Coventry, and you can just see behind it, peeking over the trees, a memorial to the civilian dead of Coventry. All of these were to be dedicated to the memory of the war's dead, but also to serve the living, to have some function for the living for whom they died. In West Ham, a badly bombed and poor area of East London, not far from the docks, an old man scowling put it like this. He said, I am opposed to putting up granite memorials. I'm in flavour of slum clearance and open spaces for our children and the children of the men who made the supreme sacrifice. And among the many letters to the War Memorials Advisory Council was one from Cheriton District Citizens Council, which declared public opinion in the district, demanded, and I quote, that no more stone slabs should be erected as war memorials, and they therefore intended to use their war memorials fund to build a larger meeting centre for the community. In East Sussex, where I live, Crover and Jarvis District Council produced a pamphlet that argued that a memorial hall would, and I quote, hallow the cherished memories of those who gave their lives and at the same time serve the cultural and social advancement of those who inherit the country. Colville Rugby Football Club in Leicestershire was planning to honour the memory of eight of its members by building a new memorial rugby ground, while Pendock Village Council in Worcestershire wrote to say it was raising money for memorial costumes for the poor. In Derbyshire, Allenton War Memorial Village was built to house disabled veterans and their families. And all of these plans for memorials 
were, were, were plans that were not simply utilitarian, but were understood at the time to be the material embodiment of the cause that the dead had died for. So the House of Lords debated the report in February 1945, and many in the Lords spoke out in favour of these more, more utilitarian form of memorials. Lord Chatfield, who chaired the council, argued that what was needed were memorials which, and I quote, will be useful to the living while honouring the dead. Unsurprisingly, perhaps the representatives of the established church insisted on the separate sacred nature of memorials. The Archbishop of Canterbury intervened to insist that the association of the memorial with those whom we desire to commemorate ought to be a guiding principle, while Bishop Bell of Chichester argued that memorials should be sacred places. Both bishops were agreed that purely utilitarian memorials would not do, while other contributors to the debate argued for just this, with Lord suggesting village halls, hospitals, community centres and a rebuilt Charing Cross Bridge would make suitable memorials, while Lord Winster argued for a memorial with no material form, suggesting that the best and finest memorial we can erect to the men who have died in this war is to ensure good treatment of the men who came back and good treatment of their dependents. And like Lord Winster, the majority of those who responded to a mass observation directive in July and August 1944, asking what are your views on the form which memorials to the dead of this war should take, were more interested in looking forward than looking back. Although many agreed with the architect Hugh Whittick, who'd written that the whole memorial in its form and character should be eloquent of its function, there was some disagreement as to what this function should be. While Whittick insisted the principal purpose of a war memorial is to stir remembering and to keep alive and forever before us what is commemorated, many mass observers put the wider needs of the living before or alongside remembrance of the dead. A 36-year-old man wrote in to suggest that the most fitting memorials would be, and I quote, large tracts of open country given to the people to enjoy. Other mass observers asked for, again I quote, more provision of playing fields and open spaces, fields, gardens and national trust lands, parks and gifts of beauty spots. But hospitals, school buildings, perhaps most often suggested housing, were all frequently suggested by mass observers as fitting memorials to this war. And the desire that memorials be useful then imbued the majority of answers. One man argued that the dead would rather be made useful memorials than mere statues and pylons, while a member of the RAF replied, I do not think they'd wish to be commemorated by a cold stone memorial. He went on to suggest libraries or parks as appropriate means of memorialising his friends. And this widely suggest idea, suggested idea, um, well, sorry, widely expressed desire that memorials have a purpose other than memorialization, perhaps tells us something about at that moment, the wider sense of what the war had been for, the belief that the war was being fought in part for a more equitable Britain. Same impetus accounts for the support for the beverage report of the, you know, the middle of the war, 1942 into 1943, and the election of the Labour government the following year. And the desire for useful memorials then can be read as an indicator, I think, of what the historian Kenneth O. Morgan has called the era of advance, the period of renewal and reconstruction that followed the end of the war, and a widespread desire among those living to give meaning to the deaths of war by linking them to this advance. And it might also tell us something about the particular way the war was fought in Britain and the involvement of much of the population in the war effort and a sense that any money spent on new, new stone memorials would be money wasted, ran through the mass observation replies. And accounts clerk in the RAF argued that we must never again allow thousands of pounds to be wasted on, wasted on purposeless heaps of stone and metal. While a female local government officer replied, I'm not interested in the dead, what I want is work and wages for the living. Many suggested memorials with no material form, such as scholarships, funding for doctors and nurses, and financial support for the families of the dead. Others reflected on the changing nature of death in wartime and the numbers of civilian dead. Perhaps picking up on a series of letters to the Times in August, several respondents suggested that bomb churches should be left as memorials, 
to the suffering of British civilians in wartime, of course, you know, several were in London, in Plymouth, in Bristol and elsewhere. A female social worker suggested, and I quote, gardens might be made on bomb sites in our great cities with a view to commemorating the civilian dead. While a male respondent argued that bombed buildings should be left stark and ugly as a reminder of the horrors of war. For some, however, I think a bitterness about the outbreak of another war so soon after the first dominated their feelings about memorials. For this group, memorials were worse than useless. The memorials of the First World War had singularly failed, failed to fill what they saw as their role to warn against any future war. Indeed, the claim that we don't want any more useless lumps of stone, which gives this talk its title, came from a mass observer who described the existing war memorials as simply places for pigeons to perch in town centres. And for this highly critical group, these memorials to the war to end all wars were seen as reminders of the failure of politicians to do so. One man, a travelling salesman aged 35, suggested bitterly they all be fitted with a plaque stating, this sacrifice was not enough, another was called for and was made, while a 42-year-old housewife pleaded for no blocks of stone or slabs of brass or any other such mockery. Nella Last, who's probably Mass Observation's best known author, um, books of her diaries have been published and she was um, she was the subject of a, of a, a dramatised version of these diaries starring the late great much Miss Victoria Wood a few years ago. She described her hatred for the existing war memorial in her hometown of Barrow and, Fer Barrow and Furnace, saying how she could see no connection between the warm, vital, laughing people she remembered and the lifeless, cold thing, is her words, which commemorated them. But in the end, of course, most of the Second World War dead were commemorated as usually shorter lists of names on the sides of existing war memorials. Austerity and the need to focus on reconstruction meant that very few of the planned living memorials were eventually built, although there are some in existence. But both large and small projects were cancelled. East Grinstead Borough Council in East Sussex cancelled their plans for playing fields, community centre and new housing in 1948, while plans for a new national memorial in central London collapsed owing to a lack of public support and funding. It was going to be completely mad, so it's just as well it collapsed, actually. Um, I can talk about that afterwards if you like. Arguably, the land fund established by Hugh Dalton when he was Chancellor, and which set aside £50 million for the purchase of, and I'm quoting here, from his um, budget speech of 1946, for the purchase of some of the loveliest parts of this land, dedicated to the memory of the war dead and the enjoyment of the living forever, was, was the largest and the most meaningful of the Second World War war memorials. It's the first bit, the first purchase was, was here, was uh, Balar Lake in Gwynedd in North Wales and the Roadenan estate on Loch Lomond in Scotland. Although the um, National Land Fund fell into disuse in the 1950s, it's more recently been buying up land for the, the enjoyment of the public. Um, it fairly recently bought um, an estate in the Cooling Mountains on Sky. And perhaps, and I hope we can see these in Dalton's own words, as the War Memorial better than any work of art in bronze or stone. So then, um, just to conclude, the feelings that were expressed about war memorials by the mass observers range from the traditional, those who wanted more crosses and memorials, so they are in a minority, so pragmatic and utilitarian to the openly critical. But what runs through most of the responses was a dissatisfaction in the 1940s with memorials to the Great War and a desire that if there were to be more, memor or, uh, more memorials to somehow do it better to honour the living alongside the dead. Far from a lack of enthusiasm for memorials indicating a people who wanted to forget death in wartime to just focus their energy on post-war reconstruction, I think the mass observation respondents wanted to create memorials that would link the dead with the living, that would give meaning to their deaths in the aftermath of the Second World War. And some historians have argued that it was the knowledge of Auschwitz and Hiroshima that acted as a rupture 
in how we think about war remembrance and memorialization, the sheer scale and horror of death that these two events represented being the, the kind of the break that negates the usefulness of existing symbols of mourning after the Second World War. But the memorial, the material that I've been talking about here this evening predates both the use of nuclear weapons against Japan and widespread knowledge of the Holocaust. And this suggests to me that the rejection of these traditional symbols of public mourning in the aftermath of the Second World War instead has its roots in the more parochial politics and the shifting beliefs of the mid 20th century. And I want to finish by arguing that we need to look at debates about war memorials in their historical context as indicative of wider beliefs, desires, politics, and perhaps power structures in 1940s Britain. And the people of 1940s Britain, far from wanting to simply forget the dead of the Second World War, expressed through their utilitarian approach to memorials, a desire that the dead of the People's War be remembered through improvements in the lives of the living. A desire, I think, that tells us as much about the popular politics of the period as it does about shifting public expressions of mourning and commemoration. Thank you. I will stop sharing my screen now. Wonderful. Well, um, Lucy, thank you very much. Um, I have to say, uh, no holds barred and really uh, moving the discussion uh, forward or the, 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 the lectures forward and uh, um, everywhere I could possibly hope uh, as we pull this uh, series together. And I think uh, for, for those like me who probably don't have as much background in reading, I think it, it, in a way it's quite shocking to hear the uh, strength of passion that, that moved this debate forward. Um, and I, I, I also reflect on perhaps our own modern perceptions today or as we look back at uh, the World War. I mean, you, you touched on it right at the very beginning. Um, uh, I suppose, uh, and please others, please put your questions in the Q&A, um, uh, otherwise I'm going to carry on talking uh, and you probably will have enough of me talking, so uh, q and in the, in the box at the bottom. But um, I suppose it would be interesting just to hear a bit more actually on, on the, the, the background to some of these really significant social changes uh, that were afoot that drove this quite um, diametric uh, change to, to memorials uh, and the, the background to it. Okay, so, you know, I, I have to kind of preface this by saying historians disagree, so you're getting my, my argument, my perspective. Um, so I think that the, the kind of the key difference or one of the key differences for Britain between the First and the Second World War is that there was a real, the, the government realised very, very early on in the Second World War, because it was such a different type of war, you know, in large part because of, because of um, uh, the expectation of, of enormous devastating air raids. They realised very early on that there was a need to kind of to bring the people with them, that this war couldn't be won without popular support. And, and but, but that, that had to be won, that couldn't be, they realised this couldn't be taken for granted, certainly in the 1930s. And one of the reasons that mass observation is, is established in 1937 is kind of looking, you know, looking across the channel, looking at what's happening in the continent, it became clear how, and again, there's echoes of this risk today, I think, how very fragile democracy was. This was a new democracy. It couldn't be taken for granted. So there's a real, a, a concerted attempt, um, in part through the Ministry of Information, but also through other means, to kind of, to win people over, to win people over to, to the war aims. People are being asked to go to war, to, um, you know, to, 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 to give up, their lives at times, but something to give up, you know, all kinds of, of kind of comforts and freedoms for the second time in a generation. And uh, that, that can't just be done by coercion, it has to be consent. And partly this consent involves the recognition that this is a war that, that is going to involve the working class, at least as much as, as, as the other social classes in Britain. And there needs to be some kind of recognition of this. There needs to be some kind of, kind of listening to what people want. And it can't just be a war that, you know, 
again, this is a cliche and a, a kind of you know, very quick survey, you know, the idea of kind of homes fit for heroes at the end of the First World War, most of which never, you know, never, never turned up, never, um, never established, as we know, Britain for all kinds of reasons in the interwar years, and particularly in the 1930s, is hugely divided along economic lines, along lines of social class, along lines of occupation, along lines of politics. So it becomes a war where the the people very broadly conceived as the people. Orwell wrote, George Orwell wrote about this really well. He said, anybody can be a member of the people as long as you are willing to be a member of the people, which you know really meant for the, for the wealthier sections of society, being willing to give up some of your luxuries to, 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 to commit to a more egalitarian society. So this, you know, this, this begins very, very early on in the war. You can see this, these, these arguments being made in 1940. You can see them being made by J.B. Priestley in his postscripts, um, famous postscripts radio broadcasts, where he almost single-handedly creates the myth of Dunkirk, but goes on to argue for this being a people's war, a more egalitarian war, a war not just at that point to defeat Nazi Germany, but a war to build a new Britain. So this has become kind of embedded it, it, it's it's the movement that that underpins the commissioning of William Beveridge to write his report on the um, uh, what was meant to be a report on kind of social insurance, how to fund things like pensions and healthcare after the war. The Beveridge report ends up saying it, it wants to to slay the five giants. I could go back and look at the screen, but I can't remember this want, idleness, poverty, I, I can't remember what the five are. And he sets out a, a, a blueprint for the creation of a welfare state. Both the main political parties commit to this, but the Labour Party commits to it far more sort of um, um, positively than the Conservative Party. Churchill's Conservative Party are understood as not really being very committed and also as they'd been in charge largely through the national government in the 1930s, never seen this kind of period of intense poverty in parts of the country. There was a kind of a lack of trust in, in the conserv that the Conservative government would enact the reforms that Beveridge, the Beveridge report had called for. It was an incredibly popular report. It went through, and this is, you know, this is a parliamentary report. I can't remember how many different um, publishing runs it went through because it sold out every time. It came. It came into the into the into the shops. It was it was debated, obviously debated in Parliament. It was debated in the army. Um, the Army Bureau of Current Affairs ran classes to allow soldiers to come and discuss this. Um, they got quite worried that there might be a mutiny in in Egypt because the soldiers there set up soldiers Parliament to discuss the beverage report. It was incredibly. Um, you know, not everybody agreed with it, but it was you know. It was widely, widely debated, widely discussed. So when you move into the end of the war, this whole kind of move towards reconstruction, this public, public discussion, very widely participated in public discussion about what kind of war, what kind of society do we want, I think really feeds into and shapes the discussion of war memorials and what I think a lot, not all, but what a lot of people want are war memorials that kind of give some meaning to the dead and give some meaning to the sacrifice of war by creating better lives in some way for the living, whether that's a bus shelter or a playground or an arms house, but they wanted, or a national park, but they yeah. wanted something that would do two things that would both commemorate the dead, but also kind of mark what they said they died for by making life better for the living. So it's a very long winded answer. No, it is, it's very, very important to get that uh, side of things. Um, I mean, it, the, the, the role of democracy, I suppose, and the, and the democratic nature of our society significantly improved and um, uh, changed through the course of World War II in a way that wasn't there uh, after the First World War. And you know, much of what you, you discuss is that wider democratic response, not just in terms of politics, but the democracy, uh, demographics of, of the people, uh, of, of that duality of, of how they, these memorials needed to be, kind of almost more of a sort of populist coming together, uh, again, not in the sort of Donald Trumpian way, but in the sort of populist um, emotions coming together and being given a, the, the everyday person being given more of a voice rather than, um, and it's no critique of the way that the World War I memorials were done, but rather just a reflection of how those commissioning them were doing them, yeah. Um, which I, I think is is, is it's more democratic, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, and I suppose it's then interesting because out of the austerity that meant that many of these weren't done, we then have a whole range of modern memorials produced to these various groups of people, some of which um, are not particularly um, reflective of the full demo demo uh, demographics of, of those who were fighting in the wars. Um, you know, it's interesting you have the morals to the uh, horses and you have the moral to the women, and we touched on it just before, but, you know, the representation of some of those who are uh, who fought and, and contributed um, significantly, whether they were uh, Sikh or Hindu or um, one ethnicity or another, are not represented in the same way. Uh, and it's very interesting, I think, to reflect on how our modern World War II um, memorials are actually very... Uh, they, they fly in the face of the spirit that was created at, at the time out of yeah. the war. And in a way, therefore, uh, has has meant that we've forgotten that spirit that you've just so eloquently put across for the last um, forty five minutes, um, and I think it's a real shame. It's uh, you know uh, th this this movement and sentiment is has been lost to the general public. I, I think uh, I said, of course, read your book, and I'm sure <laughs> we would get more of it again. But how can we therefore create new memorials today? that reflect uh, that sentiment that was there uh, and I mean I don't I don't know I guess that the best if, if we're really going to try to reflect the sentiment the best the best memorial would be to try to create a fairer society wouldn't it I mean I think we are you know there have been so many as I showed at the beginning so many new memorials to the Second World War in the last 20 years and because I think we are as a society kind of rather obsessed the second not in a particularly healthy way at the moment um i think you know that a lot of them are are kind of that they're, they're the kind of projects that have come out of pressure groups or you know particular particular organizations so they're you're right they're not they're not particularly inclusive i think they really um they really vary in quality but i think that they're also they're partly there because of the you know the kind of the the lack of memorialization at the end of, of the second world war because you know some of the the more utilitarian war memorials do go up and i but i do think that uh, you know kind of looking back i do think that perhaps the bishops and some of the others who had the point that you know these need to be recognizable as war memorials they had a point it's you know you, you don't necessarily know that the bus shelter or the village hall is also a war memorial it doesn't that that function can be slightly lost I think behind the, the the its usefulness, its utilitarian, its utilitarian function. So I think we partly we've we've kind of had this this kind of wave of of memorialization, um, as a both because we we are for all sorts of complicated reasons obsessed with the Second World War at the moment, but also because it wasn't done at the end of the Second World War. So there's this sense that there's a gap. I think. I think that the national. Um... Uh, Memorial Arboretum perhaps is one of those examples actually which probably combines the spirit of everything that you've spoken about of, of it being a shared space with that uh, real strength that I think perhaps gets lost from you know when you look at the, the strength of the Armistice Day of the uh, Remembrance Day of the these stones uh, that were created, it, it is still a focal point for people uh, in memorials and having somewhere to go. And I think perhaps that the power of creating a space which is therefore able to be enjoyed by, by many and for those who want to go somewhere, I think it is a, a very powerful way of kind of doing a modern interpretation of what perhaps was being sought. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very conscious of time. Um, uh, and um, I wanted to say a, a huge thank you. I, I could carry on talking about this with you for, for many more uh, hours, but um, you've given so much time already this evening and uh, I know preparing these talks is um, also takes a lot. So you've, you've been teaching and, and everything else goes with it. So uh, a huge thank you from the Lachlan Trust, from, from myself, from everyone who's joined this evening. Um, and um, uh, yeah, many, many, many thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks, Robbie, and thanks, everyone, for coming along.